Growing up in Santa Fe in the 1960s, my friends and I used to ride our bikes up and down the streets, and we felt like the whole city belonged to us. The plaza in the center of town was where people would go to catch up, do a little shopping, and little adobe houses dotted the area. When you think back to your childhood, do you have a picture of the place that made you who you are today? What is it like now? Has it changed much? Well, Santa Fe is quite different. The plaza now is lined with high-priced shops, selling southwestern art, turquoise jewelry, and real estate is astronomical around the heart of the city. How did this happen? You could say it was too much of a good thing. Over a million people came to visit my hometown last year from all over the world. What was it that drew so many people to my humble little community? Was it the magnificent Sangre de Cristo Mountains, the pure desert air, the spectacular sunsets? Well, plenty of places match Santa Fe in natural beauty. Probably what it was was the mystique or illusion of Santa Fe. People came to experience an Adobe Disneyland. <laughs> an Adobe Disneyland of mesas and margaritas. <laughs> Quaint, yes. Captured, frozen in time. A place rich in Spanish and Pueblo Indian history and culture. Well, Santa Fe was the capital, the remote capital, of Spain in the northern frontier during the 17th and 18th centuries here in the New World. Santa Feans, at that time, were self-sufficient. The people who lived here survived basically by their wits. It was a unique blend of Spanish and Indian influences during this period. The art, the religious beliefs, the traditions were part of what made Santa Fe what it was. How did this legacy create the best place for shopping, according to USA Today's 2013 Reader's Poll. <laughs> well, how did this happen? Take a cup of historical revisionism. Santa Fe has not always been a paradise of cultural harmony. There have been plenty of squabbles. You can add a sprinkling of stereotyping. Santa Fe residents do not live in a land of perpetual siestas. <laughs> Add a layer of chocolate frosting. In 1957, the city passed building ordinances requiring brown adobe-style architecture in the downtown historic zone. Mix all this together, let it bake under the beautiful New Mexico sun for a few decades, and what do you have? A tourist industry that generates over a billion dollars in revenue annually. But culture is more than just a pleasant backdrop for entrepreneurs and commerce. Sometimes the line that separates authentic culture from commercial culture can be blurred. The marketing of art, architecture, festivals is a central part of communities that cater to tourist dollars. And this isn't only particular to Santa Feans. Native Hawaiians and Chinese San Franciscans also know what I'm talking about. What no tourist community wants is to be left on the trash heap of yesterday's in spots. It's like what Yogi Berra said about a busy New York restaurant. Oh, that place, 
It's not that popular anymore. Too many people go there. <laughs> Former Santa Fe Mayor Debbie Jaramillo said this in voicing her concern over growing gentrification. They painted the downtown brown and moved the brown people out. When do the stereotypes surrounding a culture become the reality? You might say that all cultures are mythical creations. Maybe what's not so important is that cultures contain myth, but rather who controls the development and perpetuation of these myths. A classic example is the 1883 Santa Fe Fiesta. The Fiesta commemorated the 333 year anniversary of the founding of the city. In reality, the anniversary that was being celebrated had no historical significance whatsoever. It was simply invented to promote tourism and, and uh, business in Santa Fe. Cultural authenticity ultimately lies in the hands of host communities. You might say that tourists are hungry for new experience and they'll eat what they are told is on the menu. It's up to host communities to prepare a cultural menu that provides a meaningful and deeper experience for visitors. It's possible to have a flourishing tourist industry without killing the proverbial golden goose. Tourists provide enormous benefits for tourist communities. The influence and change that newcomers bring can be the lifeblood of these communities. But it's possible to share a cup of water without giving away the fountain. I propose three ways in which cultural communities can maintain sovereignty and keep sustainable structures. First, promote cultural education. That is education that focuses on authenticity and historical integrity and avoids simplified stereotypes. Secondly, also encourage sustainable and affordable housing, which can ensure that indigenous cultures and populations can remain intact. <laughs> and lastly, support and encourage sustainable development that protects the natural resources and creates an economic base that is diverse and not overly dependent on tourism. I believe we owe this to the children riding their bikes through their neighborhoods today and tomorrow so that they can declare, this is my hometown, like we once did. And as they become part of the larger world, here's hoping that they'll feel a connection with their cultural heritage and their roots. Because after all, isn't that what's really important in the long run? A hometown that still feels like home? <laughs>